Good morning. I'm Allison Overseth. It is my honor and privilege to serve as the executive director of the Partnership for After School Education, PACE. And on behalf of the PACE staff and board, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, <laughs> neither of the people who we work with at Ford Foundation could be here in absentia. We are thanking them because. 120 of you signed up in the first 90 minutes after we put this out, expecting that we would have 30. So they came through, they stepped up, and they provided this extraordinary space with this beautiful breakfast. We have all of our folks over in the AV helping us out here in a really good way. So if we could, please say a thank you to Sanjeev Rao and Fred Freelo, even though they are not here. <laughs> thank you. A special thank you to Bound Foundation for, and uh, Lena Townsend is here, and I think we expect Ann Lawrence later. This was an idea about a year ago that we've been kicking around for a while, and we are very, very excited that we both have the honor and the privilege to continue the Bound legacy. Uh, it's particularly special to PACE because our initial grant and much of the idea of PACE originally came from Bound, so this is a really lovely way that good things come back around. And uh, to Lena and her colleagues at Bound, thank you so much for supporting this series. <laughs> and then at Pace, we are also always lucky to have an extraordinarily engaged board. So to Greg McCaslin, Fern Kahn, Fern, where are you, who chairs our board, Ken Durrett, and some other Pace board members who are coming and going during the morning. I just want to say thank you. Everything we do is better because you support us at Pace. So thank you very much for being here. Housekeeping, uh, bathrooms back down through the uh, elevators where you came, men's to the right, women's to the left. There's also some right here if, if need be, um, but there's more available down that direction. Wi-Fi you have here, feel free to tweet and all the rest of it. Uh, password, there's Twitter information on your agenda as well. Great breakfast, donuts, I'm just saying, uh, in this room <laughs> over here, <laughs> so loving this. Uh, so I, hopefully that takes care of housekeeping pace, people. Have I forgotten anything? Okay, for starters. A little background and I guess context. We, um, in fact, I was at a meeting here in this very room a year ago, and as part of a very, very rich day of discussion of adolescent learning, a very small part of the day involved uh, a research presentation. And... A couple of things occurred to me during that, and one was that we didn't necessarily have the people who could use this research best in the room. It was a lot of policymakers and others, which is great at this level, but if we're not implementing what we know into what we do, we are missing an opportunity. And so sort of got this discussion thinking about how do we democratize research? And it's not that we don't all have access to the books and the papers if we really dive into it and if we all had an extra three hours in our day every day. But for many of us to think about what that means to our practice, we need, we need to process. We need a chance to discuss with our colleagues. We need a, just the space, literally, to figure out what this means to me, either day after tomorrow or possibly over the next five years, and how I think about how I'm investing in what I'm doing in practice. And so this research series is PACE's attempt to connect these two things. Let's get really smart people who have done really extraordinary research, some of which is very affirming to our practice as it is, and some of which is really indicative of, of those factors that make us successful, and thinking about those times when we are less successful and maybe why that is, and de diving a little bit more deeply. But then, frankly, this is a working session. We really then want to say, if I know this, what do I do with it? And so we will, through the day, we'll start with a pretty formal lecture from our distinguished colleague, Dr. Eddie Fergus. Um, we will, and we will hold questions during that period of time. So write down any questions you might have. We will then have a 30-minute period of time for Q&A for clarifying questions, just to make sure we understood exactly what um, Eddie's research is about. And then we'll break into table discussions. And each of you have a table captain there. And thank you to for table captains for volunteering would probably be overstating it, for accepting the invitation to, uh, to be a captain at your table. And we really want to write down all your ideas about what this means. And it can be really small and really very practical. Like, I'm going to go back and talk to fill in the blank person at my organization just to make sure that we're thinking about this differently, if, if that's what you feel. PACE will then take this information and get it out into our world and after school. So you are working on behalf of your colleagues today. 
and really thinking about how can your impressions and your perspectives be helpful to your colleagues and hopefully this can generate an ongoing conversation about how we can improve practice based on this set of research. Eddie has generously agreed to be our pilot researcher um, and I appreciate that. Eddie's been very involved in thinking about this with us. He is a member of the PACE board and a very, very valued colleague. And we are in process of thinking about how does this work. So at the end of the day, when we do the reviews and evaluations of the session, really want your input. This worked for me, this could be a little better, this would be easier. So we just need that, that um, input. This is the first of what we hope will be eight series of research presentations. And so we, we can do better and smarter um, if you tell us what we need to do better and smarter. In your packets, you have um, a whole bunch of information. One flyer in particular I want to make sure you see, which is the discount form to order Eddie's book if you would like it. So um, that is in your flyer, and his publisher has kindly offered us all discounts, so that is, that is here. Um, there are also the two sheets that are on, one in orange and one in green. Uh, the non-white sheets will be collected at the end, so please write lots and lots of notes on them, and then we will be collecting those just to make sure that we get all of your feedback. And with that, pay staff, have I missed anything in terms of starting off? Are we good? Okay. Yes, right on time. So, with this, I am delighted to introduce Eddie Fergus. Um, Eddie, you have his bio in your packets. He is a longtime deputy director of the Metro Center at NYU, and he is now an assistant professor at the Steinhardt School. He is um, a researcher, a teacher, and a practitioner, and one of the reasons I've always enjoyed working with Eddie is that he has a very practical understanding of, because of his own background as both a teacher and practitioner, of what it is we do in after school, and therefore what the implications and the um, relevance of his research can be. And without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our first researcher in our ongoing series, the inaugural, the premiere, the first, uh, <laughs> Dr. Edward Fergus. Uh, all right, good well, with this room filled up. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am so delighted that we are at this stage, given this year-long uh, it was about a year ago, I think it was last year in August or late July, and I was sitting on this, actually there was a stage here, and I was moderating a panel of researchers, and it was great to listen to their stuff, and I started asking the question, so, and what do you do with this, right? And it was, it was and it's the, you know, the inevitable blah, 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 and it's like, no, <laughs> we have got to really get down and gritty and textured around trying to translate research. So. I am delighted and honored that Pace has uh, asked me to be uh, the inaugural sort of pilot. You know, we're going to work out all the kinks, right, <laughs> with me. Um, I also want to thank Ford Foundation in terms of stepping up at this last moment. I think we did not anticipate. This was supposed to be at NYU, actually, and we were anticipating, ah, there will be 40 people most. That's great. Nice and, nice and intimate, right? And you all just blew it up. Um, and I, but I think it's also a testament to the desire for this dialogue to actually occur. So, um, so I'm, I am um, completely humbled by that reality. Uh, and I kept telling Allison as we were emailing back and forth, you know, uh, you know uh, she kept saying, no, this is because you are presenting it and you're bringing it in. You know, so I'm trying to absorb that in a most humbling way. Um, also, you know, I... I um, Obviously, I want to thank the Bound Foundation for having the um, taking this, you know, this faith in terms of this being a relevant conversation point for us to have um, in terms of the recognition that research needs to live in practice and practice needs to live in research. And as somebody who has um, uh, who has, you know, I have existed all of my professional life straddling both. And uh, I had a conference call with somebody a couple of uh, days ago who asked me, you know, said, you know, I'm talking with you because somebody else said that you do it really well. And I said, I have no idea if I do it really well. I just know that that's just the realities that I live and I can't give up either one, right? I can't give up being a practitioner. So I love being in programs. I love visiting schools. You know, um, I spend two to three days out of every week during the school year in schools, right? Working with principals and teachers and superintendents, which, you know, uh, which is 
unheard of within the context of academia, particularly in schools of education, which you would think would be a little odd, right? But, um, and I kept looking around as I looked at my college, I was like, when, when, was, the, when was the last time you were in school? What are you, you know, I live in schools. That's what I, I live and do, you know? Um, and also, I, after school for me has always been a very core element to who I am because that's where I really, you know, aside from being a teacher, I moved in then into after school, right? Um, and that's where I really learned about what it means to uh, really think about the development of youth. And so for me, um, after school work, out of school time has always had a very special place in my heart and also uh, a, a, an orientation that's actually been filtered throughout all of my research. So, so I'm excited to really be this, you know, to kind of get this going. Um, I am, as, uh, as Allison mentioned, my goal is to do a lecture. And, uh, and for all of my graduate students who take classes with me know that I am horrible with lectures because I am all about checking for understanding because I will stop and, and ask, did, did we understand that? Do I need to situate it in a different way? Do I need to give it another example? But I'm going to try to be true to the lecture modality. So if I ask, does that make sense? Um, don't talk back to me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because then you'll encourage me. Just nod and say yes, uh huh, amen, whatever you want to say. All right, uh, because that's it's it is it's it's, it's going to be really tough for me. So I'm, but I'm going to do good. I'm going to. That's what I'm telling myself. Um, and so I'm going to take my time to really lay out this research study, and I'm going to start with sort of really foundational in terms of what what got us to this research, and then I'm going to get into nitty gritty of the research, right? And I uh, and so you're you're when we get to the Q and A, I really want you all to to ask me you know deep questions around sort of the study, how to you know. Um, and particularly sort of clarifying things. And I'm going to share, I'm going to try to be mindful of not getting too, uh, too much into the weeds of methodology, right, in terms of research methodology, uh, because I also want to be mindful of that, you know, uh, you know that you're going to trust me that I did the right things in terms of research methodology, right? Right? Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not going to get too much into the weeds of that. So with that said, let's get started. All right, we're off. So, um, so as you know, the the title of of, of this book, uh, of this study, schooling for resilience, folk really focused on improving the life trajectory. Um, what always really stands out in understanding sort of the relevance of this population for me has always been not un not only sort of understanding a population in terms of a moment in time, but actually understanding the population as it's experiencing a life trajectory. So it became you know, ri vitally important that as we thought about this study, um, that we paid attention to the idea of trajectory and not snapshots or moment in time, right? Uh, I think about, you know, I have this same orientation when I do work with schools around school discipline, right? That, um, that every time kids are being disciplined or suspended, that when they come back, they have to transition back and we have to, as adults, know how to forgive the behavior. And we have to understand the function of the behaviors, and we can't re-penalize individuals. So because it is not about the moment in time, it is about paying attention to the longer life trajectory. So um, I'm going to pay particular attention to making sure that I connect those dots in terms of the research around sort of really outlining this trajectory, and, um, and in particular connecting the dots of to, res to the research to the practice. Because um, a couple of days ago, the person who I was talking to and asking me, so how do you um, how do you make decisions around, you know, um, how you translate your practice work? And I say, it actually starts from the moment I start doing research. Any research has to have, um, has to answer a practical question. I cannot do research around things that just seem interesting, right? Because there are a lot of interesting things in the world, but it's, if it's not a question that's relevant for us to, you know, uh, a problem for us to solve, then I, I, I can't get involved in it, Right. Um, you know, I, I can name a whole host of research that I, I read it. I'm like, really? Did we really need to do research around that? I think we kind of know the answer to that. Or are we just trying to answer something that, uh, uh, that we know is not going to really serve any population? So I'm going to be very mindful of making sure I make the clear connections to the practice that stem that was sitting with us from the moment we started this research. So let me start um, first by kind of situating my story. Um, and I, because I'm, I, I always say that the research that researchers do is always closely aligned with their own stories, right? Because we're all trying to resolve our own sets of issues, right? 
because uh, we have issues. We all have issues. And researchers, academics, we all have issues. And we're all playing them out within our own research. Researcher who doesn't tell you they, they aren't, ask them more questions. Okay? <laughs> so my story, um, you know, I'm a, uh, what, what's called what Alejandro Portes, uh, who's a researcher at Princeton, calls a one and a half generation. Right? Um, my first language is Spanish. You know, I came to this country from Panama when I was about 10 years old. And so for me, my story has always been around sort of that immigrant experience of what it means to enter a new context in which, one, um, I had to quickly learn a new language and not just a language, but also cultural habits, right? So individuals always ask me, why is it that you have such a, you know, I don't hear an accent, right? And I said, well, I think accent is all, you know, how we hear accents um, is all, you know, relative, right? Um, and then secondly is that I, I jokingly now say, you know, well, I watch a lot of American TV and I learned how to mimic an American accent. Okay? So which oh, doesn't always go too well with folks. Um, but that's part of my reality, right? Um, so it also helps to situate the way in which I, I understand the world. So for me, I'm always thinking in two languages, right? So there are moments where you will see that I will pause, and that's because there are moments where I'm like, I can only think of the word in Spanish, and I'm really trying hard to translate, right? Um, I'm also um, a child of, uh, you know, the reason why we're in the U.S. is because my uh, father joined the U.S. military, right? And uh, so uh, being U.S. military, um, obviously we became naturalized citizens. I attended uh, three uh, different elementary schools, two middle schools, and two high schools, right? Uh, and um, I'm so not well adjusted because of that. Uh, but it's also part of my, it's my story, right? It is my story in terms of how I understand having gone through so many different types of schools and um, had to figure out how to adapt, right, in these different contexts, not only adapt the types of schools I was going into, but also adapting to the different friendship networks that I had to mold myself into, um, you know, to the extent to which I, I remember when I got to the last high school I was in, um, I was placed in mostly AP and honors classes, and I realized the friendship network that I was developing, none of my friends were in there. So I actually, the following semester, I went to my counselor and said, I want to get out of all of these AP and honors classes because I, none of my friends are in there, you know? Um, it was mostly, you know, I was, I'm a child of a uh, enlisted, you know, uh, army person, you know, and most of the kids were in there were officers' kids. We had none in common, okay? Uh, so, and so that was a very sobering reality as I reflected on sort of doing that for a couple of years. Then finally my senior year I said, okay, I gotta get back into AP classes because I, you know, I figured, I realized I gotta go to college. So, um, eventually after um, uh, I ended up going to, to college in uh, Wisconsin, um, some would say, well, why did you end up in Wisconsin? Well, supposedly my father was gonna be stationed in Chicago ended up being a lie. He ended up stationed in upstate New York, 30 miles from the Canadian border, and I really was not going to school up there. So I ended up in school in Wisconsin and ended up uh, uh, certifying as a social studies teacher, um, getting a degree in political science, teaching there, um, very humbling experience, and then ended up, as, as most teachers do, applying to uh, graduate school, ended up in a PhD program at University of Michigan, um, where um, I actually, you know, part of what I... Um, what uh, that's really the time frame between college and teaching and going to graduate school that I really sort of solidified this um, this desire, this interest, this um, this niche of really sort of wanting to understand the ways in which we conceptualize policies and practices um, in ways that are are built on sort of our social understanding of the population that we're trying to resolve. Right? Any types of policies and practices that are developed are premised on certain understandings that we have of the pop population that we're trying to serve. Right? And so all of my work has really sort of tried to, um, to circle around that set of notion. And in particular, this idea of what we consider the best for a community, right? Uh, for those of you who uh, follow, so see my tweets, I lately, for the last six months, I've been tweeting a great deal about how uh, in this country, there's been a lot of legislators that have been uh, what I call disciplining the poor, um, where they are passing legislation in which you know, individuals who are receiving TANF or food stamps are not allowed to get lobster, right? They can't get beer. They can't, because there is, a, there is a, 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 an undergirding idea that what's best for the community is we need to discipline them out of being poor, right? So I'm constantly sort of really questioning the way in which we, um, we are doing that to our populations based on our, our understanding of them. And then lastly, obviously, I've, you know, um, I have been a reluctant academic. I'll be I want to confess that. I have never wanted to be a professor. 
It was never part of the plan. It was never in the cards. You know, when I finished my degree in uh, 2002, um, I was working at the Children's Aid Society at a community school as a program director. That was I wanted to do. That's what I I love being in practice, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, but I also I moved into doing evaluation work of out of school time programs in schools and um, and then and ended up running a center for nine years. And then as of recent, you know, now I am become, you know, that which you try to st really stay away from for as long as possible ends up coming back your way. It's like a boomerang effect. Right. So I ended up now here at um, at NYU as a faculty member, but still at the core of what I do is still paying attention to the nature of how policies and practices are framed. So my work is always paying attention to two big things, system gaps and reform. So what are the gaps that are existing within our systems and how do we fix them, right? So I'm always thinking about my goal, uh, focus around equity-driven leadership. Um, uh, that's the sort of the niche or the set of, you know, cadre of individuals that I'm very much invested in. So that's why I spend two to three times Every, uh, three to three days every week in schools with principals and superintendents because that's the, the, the body of work that I've been taking and translating all of my policy and practice work, right? So I do a lot of research around disproportionality and suspension, gifted programs, and special ed, and I take that body of work and I translate it into developing equity-driven leaders in school districts because I see them as a critical uh, 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 lever for making change. And the other area of work that I do is really around, so how do we make sure that systems understand supports of resilience development, right? And in particular, and this is where the crux of what I'm going to focus in on for this morning is recognizing that our environments need to be protective of the population that they are serving, right? It is not to be another risk environment. And I'm going to talk a little gr a great deal in terms of why that is relevant. So, so let me go through in terms of talking about, so what kind of, what was foundational to doing this research study? And I, I will talk in detail in terms of how do we actually, you know, who funded us and where were we at and all that. Uh, but what was foundational to our research was really understanding that, that the context, right? And when we talk about context, I'm always thinking about environments, surroundings, relationships, et cetera. That's what context um, uh, we're, we're always describing um, shapes the understandings of behaviors and actions and possible selves of the individual, right? So we're not treating the person as separate from context, but recognizing that the person and context are constantly interchanging with each other. They're always paying attention to um, to shaping each other, to making um, uh, uh, connections to each other. You know, so for example, you know, um, uh, I'm very much rec recognizing that you know, though my first language is Spanish and I speak Spanish at home all the time, and then when I'm I leave my home, oh, I'm like, oh, I got to change the structure of my uh, language. I know that when I walk out, I am constructed as I am only black, right? So that has a particular reality. That shapes my particular understandings of how I need to negotiate the different types of contexts that I walk in and out of, right? So how I drive out in the world, how I go into supermarkets, I have to be readily conscious of that reality, right? So I real quickly, this past weekend, um, I'm into, I run 5Ks. So this past weekend, I ran another 5K and I'm sweating bullets, and I walk up to the table where they have the bagels. How many of you run uh, and see the bagel table or the, the banana table, right? So I'm like, I need a bagel because I'm like starving. So, and then there's a line of us, right? Uh, and I'm one of very few black people who is there. And um, so I walk up and I say, can I get a, you know, I, I'd like a, a, a bagel. And a woman looks at me and says, um, did you, are you a runner? Were you registered? I'm like, I have my number, bib. <laughs> I am sweating. I'm like, uh, yeah, and I'm looking at everybody else. I'm like, you didn't ask anybody else, right? So I had to recognize, okay, what happened in this context? What, you know, um, and it wasn't about, you know, th that person had no context in terms of my language, you know, diversity, as well as my racial diversity, right? So I'm always paying attention to recognizing that context is always shaping the way in which we become, we understand the world. So, um, so there's always this interaction that we are always, uh, that I'm always paying attention to a person of context and the types of behaviors, beliefs, um, and attitudes that um, that are being developed in that interaction, right? Um, and it's not always, as you see the arrows, it's not a one-way interaction. They're always shaping back and forth. So that's always um, a way in which, oh, the animation worked, that, uh, that, uh, that leads and is feeding the research, and in particular, this research that, um, that we endeavored. So a particular interest that we had around the person the context and beliefs and attitudes 
um, was this framework that Margaret Beale Spencer, who's a child developmental psychologist, um, and you know, for those who who know me, I, there's very few researchers that I get geeked out about. Margaret is one of them that I get geeked out about. Like, if she is, <laughs> I get an amen, all right. Um, I, not only so I love her research, but I love her. She is fabulous. You know, I've had her, I've actually had her bring her to NYU to do a talk, and, you know, we've collaborated on projects. She's been such a nice, nurturing person for me um, that I appreciate that in relation to the fact that I've actually been using her theoretical frameworks to really help me think through this connection between person, context, and beliefs. And what she talks about is, her uh, conversation around the inter interaction between the person and the context is that we have to understand that there's a way um, that each person also lives with their levels of vulnerability. We all are vulnerable sets of individuals in how we traverse the world, right? And recognizing that we're all exposed to some different levels of risk and protective factors. And that type of exposure, right, that relationship between person and context, right? So if you're in a context in which there are, there are guns, right? that's gonna affect and shape the, your understanding of the world and how you m operate as a person, that's gonna shape the types of beliefs and understandings and, and attitudes that you develop, right? Um, and so what, um, what Margaret talks about is that uh, we have to make sure that as we are contextualizing this relationship around um, uh, the person and the context is understanding that there's high and low risk and high and low protective factors. Because for some reason, we've gotten into this slippery conversation that we treat all risks the same and we treat all protective factors the same, right? And we have to recognize that, that that's a very interesting nuance for us to pay attention to in the interaction between the person and the context. So I, I'm a big visual person. So this is, this is the visual that Margaret talks about, which she calls it the dual axis of vulnerability, which is that as you see there, you see the risk factors, they're high and low, protective factors are high and low. Um, and what she talks about in each quadrant is that um, we are fixated on that, that top left, from your perspective is left, right? <laughs> uh, this high vulnerability group, right? We are fixated and we're constantly trying to figure out how do we fix them? How do we help them? How do we intervene? Now we need to do evidence-based programs. We, how much dosage, right? I was working with a principal a couple of weeks ago where somebody was presenting around a mentoring program that they were doing. Um, and uh, one of the principals raised their hand and said, um, so tell me, so for how long do we need to mentor these black boys? And so for me, I was like kind of taken aback because there is a degree to which we were treating as if there's a threshold to how much we need to give them, you know, before we kind of, it gets fixed, right? Um, and part of that is because we have a misunderstanding of how we construct programmings, you know, uh, for that top left quadrant based on the bottom right quadrant, right? The low protective factors and high, I mean high protective factors, low risk kits, right? That we have to make sure that we understand, we contextualize how kids are constructing their own life trajectories are also bound to the types of risk, high or low, and protective factors, high or low, that are surrounding them. And until we are conscious of that context playing such a, uh, a nuanced role, we're gonna constantly be vacillating back and forth and taking the ideas that we get from the bottom right quadrant and trying to transplant them into the top left quadrant, right? So that's an important concept for us to, uh, to make sure that we, um, that we grapple with and understanding the, the relationship between person and context, right? So that it's not just a, um, it's not just taking sort of the set of experiences that one group has and plant, transplanting it into others, right? So, um, now, risk and protective factors, so what are they, right? Risk factors, I think we can, we can rattle them off, right? They can be socioc they are socioeconomic status. They could be, you know, I am always, when I always like talk to practitioners, I say, so name risk factors, and they will name a whole host of them, you know, to one single parent home, and all the things that we have codified within our society as risk factors, right? So, and I think we can get into a much longer conversation around what are real risk factors. I'm not sure we would say a single parent household is a risk factor, but rather, what are, the, what are the conditions surrounding the single parent home that creates a further risk versus just having one parent? Because I think that's a, a, a mis, uh, misconceptualization that we actually have. And the same thing around protective factors, when we talked about high and low protective factors. You know, when especially when I talk to school practitioners, they're always saying, oh, school's a protective factor. I say, yeah, but is it a high or low protective factor, right? Schools that have high suspension habits, 
um, very uh, low um, uh, uh, enrollments in terms of racial ethnic minority kids and gifted programs, high enrollment in terms of special ed of, of boys and racial ethnic minority, I would consider those a very low protective environment, right? Because there's something about that context that is interacting with that person, right? That's going to eventually sort of start changing the, the, the ways in which they believe in uh, the, the types of beliefs and attitudes that they maintain about the population that they serve. So, so that's an important concept. So, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to be illustrative in terms of my examples. So if we treat, if we had, you know, these types of contextual things happening in our environment where our conversation is about sort of there's guns in schools or there's an achievement gap in education, right? Um, if we understand that those are some of the contextual issues, um, you know, our practices, unfortunately, uh, we start responding in these particular ways, right? Uh, because there's an understanding that we have around uh, the population that lives in that top left quadrant that unfortunately um, it, it we don't do enough of. So we, we may respond in ways where we now aren't putting enough social workers within our school settings, right? Even though we know the school environment isn't protective enough, right? We even though we know that, um, you know, uh, uh, I will even throw in here, I couldn't find a, 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 a picture of uh, that said guidance counselors because they're another important entity that also um, can operate to provide a, uh, to be protective for our set of kids within school settings. And then lastly, obviously after school, right? The, um, you know, part of what we have to recognize of thinking about that top quadrant is that the nature to which you're exposed to high risk on a perpetual basis requires that we have um, a high number of environments that are, uh, are focused in on making sure that they are um, focused on development, right? And one of the things I've always appreciated about after school work is that there is an attention to youth development, which I treat as conceptually, particularly if you're thinking about the 40 developmental assets that the Search Institute talks about, that it is about being protective, right? Now, we don't always do a good job around it, right? Now, part of the where we struggle also has to do with some of the concerns that are constantly raised, right? The degree to which do we have enough funding to do the type of after school work that we know our kids need? And and because that has an impact in terms of the programming, it has an impact in terms of how much staff you have, the degree to which you can provide your staff with trainings for them to be ready to be sufficiently protective for our kids. So it's 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 uh, so it's vitally important that we're always paying attention to that. A couple of other set of theories that I want to make sure that um, that I tease out that also are interacting with this idea of person, context, and beliefs. We've read a great deal around the resilience, the grit, the perseverance dialogue that's happening, um, which I, one of the things I love with an education is that when we hear something, we put it into our bloodstream quickly, right? And we're just absorbing it full force. I, you know, I'm always the, so what was the intention of the research and why are we absorbing it this way? And, you know, I'm very cautious about this grit dialogue that's continuously occurring. Um, and I bring it up simply because it is part of the person context conceptualization that happens, that uh, what's happening around that research around grit and perseverance is that it's not sufficiently paying attention to context. It's only paying attention to the person and the types of beliefs and attitudes that the individual is developing. And what's concerning for me is because there's an absence of contextualizing the idea that grit gets is, uh, exists in multifaceted ways, right? So if you, for those of you who are research junkies and you actually read Angela Duckworth's original research, personality research around grit and perseverance, it was actually built off of uh, research studies of uh, West Point graduates, spelling bee champions, right? And I'm not exactly sure that their grit, that, that's, that's the bottom right quadrant, relates to the top left quadrant of grit, right? So the, um, and I think we need to be mindful of how we pay attention to absorbing that set of information so that it's not isolated. So the, you know, and this is not to downplay the con concept of it, but rather how we have taken it into the bloodstream of our work that is troublesome, right? Um, you know, there are schools that I, I've worked with where they have, um, th they have uh, grit report cards for the kids. And I, I'm going to leave that as that. That's my question mark. <laughs> okay? So I put a little X there. All right. So the other area is trauma, right? One of the things that I'm, I'm so glad that's entering our water stream of conversation is this notion of 
that individuals have different degrees of trauma that they're experiencing, whether it's emotional, physical, cultural, or what have you. And in particular, Sandy Bloom's work around um, trauma, uh, she talks about the idea of uh, shifting away from um, what's happened to you to, uh, from, from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you, right? Which is an important conceptualization that we have to do within our own work uh, in thinking about this concept of, of trauma, that it is not just a matter of, the, you got trauma, you got, you know, and I hear this from, practitioners now, well, my kids are traumatized. I said, okay, so how does that begin to inform and help you think about your programming, about what you're doing in your sites? And, you know, to, and my push is always, you know, to extract that it's, you know, um, the, the, the trauma pieces that Sandy Bloom's work and others have written about is not just about the fact that there is trauma, but also how we respond, right? And the response, what she frames around, it's shifting our conversation away from what's, uh, what's wrong with you to what's happened to you. And it's a very different um, orientation for us to actually absorb. Um, the other area is obviously in terms of relational development. Um, uh, and in particular, I, I'm enjoying the fact that neuroscience, that we as practitioners are now delving into sort of how neuroscience is also helping us think about um, the realities that our kids are experiencing. Um, if those of you, you know, another, you know, uh, um, you know, another sort of junky thing that you want to, or geeky thing that you want to read, is the National Research Council put out a report. It's, it's uh, not a little report. It's actually this thick. It's a book. Um, back in 2000, you can actually download it for free off their website. Uh, on the I, the recognition that um, it was looking at kids uh, zero to five and paying attention to the idea that there's a relationship between neurons and neighborhoods. That we all develop the same set of neurons, but they start shutting down at certain di different points depending on the types of neighborhood types of uh, intersection, intersections and interactions that are happening for us. And so they really push the idea that it's not an all or nothing, like once they shut off, that it's done. But rather, there's ways in which we can actually create protective environments to continue growing that and nurturing the redevelopment of neurons. So, um, and in particular, uh, what they talk a great deal about is the relational development, that relationship piece of it, uh, which I will bring back a little later. Obviously, there are, there's also res other research that we paid attention to and that's foundational to us and thinking about stereotype threats, it's stereotype threats in terms of, so there could be a person in context interaction that's happening that could also have detrimental effects, right? So you have the stereotype threat research um, that um, Claude Steele and Josh Aronson have, um, and there are tons of spinoffs that have been done around uh, that set of research that pays attention to the ways in which those types of individual experiences um, within a context can, um, can alter the way in which um, individuals, particularly youth, know whether or not they can be successful within a context, right? So if I'm constantly hearing different levels of microaggressions that are happening within the context of my school or in my classroom, then what's the degree to which that I'm going to have enough, where's the, how is that going to affect my sense of perseverance within a context that is constantly saying, are you sure that's the right answer, right? I was in a school last week where a second grade teacher was asking kids to give them, you know, tell me the number of sentences that you should have in a paragraph, and kids were second graders. They were putting up their fingers, putting up different numbers, cute. The teacher's response was, you know, that's a silly answer. That's a crazy answer, right? So there was no, I, I, there was no affirmative language that pointed to, I like the effort that you put into trying to give me an answer. That's not quite there. Let's, who else has an answer, right? Rather than affirm the effort, we were downgrading the, the, them in terms of the, the type of cognitive work that they were actually doing. So how do we begin understanding um, and paying attention to this? So one of the things that we decided to do for this study was we wanted to stay away from, uh, we were asked by the Gates Foundation back in 2006 to study single-sex schools because they were, as you know, that was the height at which um, Gates Foundation was funding small high schools, right? That was just every small high schools. That's going to solve high schools. Um, that's a whole other conversation. And what was also occurring is there were a great deal of middle schools and high schools that were opening up as single-sex schools. And they wanted to understand, are single-sex schools better than co-ed schools? And we actually pushed back and said, we don't want to study that. What we want to study is, so what does a school do when they have a particular orientation towards a population that they're serving, and how do they program themselves, right? We wanted to ask a very different question rather than sort of feed a, 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 a line of conversation that doesn't really get us anywhere, right? Because there is sufficient research on either end of it that has, you know, and we can continue battling that, right? But we really wanted to get into a much broader conversation around, so what does it mean for a context to actually shift itself 
to actually protect and be uh, re- relational to the population that they're serving. So, so that was our focus in terms of what we wanted to do with our study. So I'm not going to go through how much data we collected. And I will, s- I will say there are, aside from this book, there are three dissertations that have, I have doc- three, doc- three PhDs now because they have, uh, uh, they have actually used data from this study. Um, and I'm still encouraging more of my doctoral students to actually use this data because we have more data than we can actually do with. Um, but as you can see in terms of the data that we collected over that time period, we talked to a lot of kids. We surveyed tons of kids. We did a lot of observations of not only just classrooms. Um, we also did a lot of observations of after school programs, right? I remember, I always remember one doctoral student who um, decided to wear heels when we were going to do observations of a Boy Scouts in the woods. And I said, uh, that's not going to work for you. Um, but we we, advent- we ventured into the realm of what the kids were doing and actually in all of their um, experiences. So we did a lot of data collection to really sort of, on one hand, on the methodology side, to really substantiate this question of, so uh, so what happens, what does a, a context do when they're trying to respond to the population that they're serving? So, so the first year of what we did is, and I'm a full believer around theory of change, is that I can't study something unless I have an understanding of the, of the adults who are actually building it out. Right. I need to get into your head to understand what did you have in mind and in terms of all of these elements of, uh, of of programming. So what we ended up building out was how they really constructed their own theory of change. Right. So there's there's two big pieces around pedagogy that they really focus in on. Um, they they framed as part of their theory of change, which is one that's instructional and one that's relational. Right. And I give examples there in terms of some of the instructional stuff that they were mindful of of wanting to develop. The relational stuff was very key. I was I called it as um, they may have, you know, if you think of two pieces of wood and you're trying to use a glue, the relational stuff was a glue. They did not see this instructional stuff, these two planks of board, making any sense unless we did the relational stuff. And that was actually core. And it'll come back when I talk about sort of what, did, um, what were some of the final findings. Um, the other piece that was uh, critical to their theory of change is we had to be strategic in every element of climate of what we did. Right so to the um, to what I call sim- they they paid a great deal of attention to what I call symbolic curriculum. Symbolic curriculum is that what you see existing in school settings all uh, I- I on the walls, right? So the um, I, you know so whenever I walk into schools and I see the don't list, don't wear your hat, don't run, don't wear a do rag, right? That's a form of symbolic cur- uh, curriculum, right? Because we are messaging to kids the idea of what we expect them not to do. If we don't tell them what to do, then we're not giving symbolically, we're not affirming them where we want them, their trajectory to actually go. So there was a great deal of attention that they had around their, um, their climate strategies. You know, there was one particular site that had a, um, a huge mural of Frederick Douglass that they had a local artist actually draw at the entrance, and it was gorgeous, right? And the school had um, about 100 kids. Uh, uh, and the first uh, first several weeks, they realized they had about 91 black kids and they had nine Mexican kids. So then they realized the principal, halfway through the year, he started noticing that because he was going to grow another grade, that he started getting more Mexican families showing up. And he said to me, Eddie, I need to adjust this mural, right? I need to also affirm that population that's also coming in here. And that's the type of way in which we wanted, why we wanted to pay attention to context is how does a context start shifting itself in recognition of the population that they're serving in a way that actually continues to affirm them. Um, And then lastly, obviously, they were paying attention to long-term outcomes. And it wasn't just they wanted the kids to graduate high school eventually, right? But it was also a matter of they wanted them to enroll in persistent college. They wanted them to have to develop career options, right? Um, and also the degree to which they also wanted them to make sure that they had leadership capacity for them to, um, uh, to have available to them, right? So they needed to have as many opportunities to actually practice being leaders within their context of their schools and within their communities and so forth. So, um, so all of these things they kept talking about is this is what's building our resilience among our, among our kids. You know, we have to do these things to build resilience in them. And, and the resilience was around, it's interesting, and, and I don't have quotes on this here, but I know it's in the book, uh, around helping the kids build resilience so they can mitigate the risk of institutionalized racism, right? So it wasn't just resilience for, I want you to be successful in college. 
I want you to be, you know, have resilience so you know how to finish your homework, right? But I want you to also have the re- to build the re- types of resilience that you need to have to know how to mitigate and manage when it does show up, right? Um, there was one experience where I remember talk, doing a focus group with some kids where they, uh, the kids went to um, a downtown part of this city and um, the kids were talking about how they loved going to that downtown area and, and then one kid started bringing up the, I was scared. I was scared about what other people were going to say about us because, you know, um, they've never seen people like us, you know, so I'm not sure if they're going to treat us well, right? And then it ins- that ensued this whole conversation around how they were thinking about this fear, right? And it was interesting to listen to that conversation. And then afterwards, you know, I, in debriefing with the adults, you know, about that focus group, you know, they appreciated that I shared that because part of what they wanted to know is, so how do they help them know how to manage that for themselves, right? Because what we don't want is kids to kind of own that as, that's, uh, that's because that's occurring because it's a problem with me, right? That's the last thing we want ki- our kids to actually own. We don't want them to treat it as if it is something that is, uh, that is a problem with me. So um, obviously, so our research, we started, it's, uh, based on the theory of change, it started playing out for us that there's an, uh, an interaction that's actually happening. Um, in, in this person in context, resilience skills and attitudes development that's actually happening with our kids. And so this is became w- our, s- our, our rough sketch in trying to figure out, like, is there something about the ways in which they're conceptualizing that instructional and relational stuff? Um, and the ways in which they're thinking about school and out of school time climate, the way in which they actually program out of school time activities. Uh, w- one of the things that I loved about all these school settings is that they were so deliberate about making sure that out of school time wasn't an extra thing, it was a necessary element of their practice because one, they wanted to keep the kids out of the community, right? So they had to keep them on site as long as they could. And even doing things like, you know, mandating, you know, kids, you have to stay after school, even though they couldn't really, right? Particularly because these are middle schools and high schools, and we all know middle school and high school kids, they vote with their feet when it comes to out of school time, right? So to help, to, to know how to rally them and keep them indoors um, was, uh, was a true endeavor. Um, the other element that we wanted to pay particular attention to, the, the particular strand of resilient skill that we were interested in was engagement. And the way in which we were exploring engagement is in three facets. One is cognitive engagement, the degree to which you're actually interested in what you're doing. Behavioral engagement, the degree to which you know how to do school. And then lastly, relational engagement, the degree to which you actually have adults who you can identify and have continuously supported you, right? Because we wanted to see how do those things help to feed those sets of types of resilient skills and attitudes, which we know from prior research helps to feed the degree to which kids are being successful in school. And obviously, because, you know, we were mindful of who our funder was, they wanted to have a particular outcome to pay attention to. So we use academic performance, right? That became our, our, our end point, but we were, more in, we were more enamored by the engagement scale. That really was fascinating to us because that's something you can take home and you can actually do work around. You can do relational work, right, at your particular sites. So, so let me describe the context. So these schools were obviously, um, and I should have said this before. There, are, there are there were seven schools, um, and in your packet on the right side, you'll see a big old table that has all seven schools and a whole bunch of uh, demographic information around those seven schools. But all seven schools are really driven around missions of. Uh, of trying to make sure that they are focused on college preparation, character development, overall mobility in society, right? They kept, these adults kept talking about, we have got to make sure that our kids are successful, that they are able to be socially and economically mobile. Um, In, you know, I I decided to pull a couple of sort of statements because I didn't want to, I'm going to show you some statistical stuff, which I also want to temper it always with some, some verbiage, some qualitative stuff. Right. In terms of so how is it that they were languaging this stuff? So we had, you know, some administrators who talked about um, the importance of their context. Right. So as you see in this administrator talked about, we spend a lot of time thinking about what it what does it mean for our boys to be successful? We understand that there are some environmental factors that play a big role in how our students come to school, their state of mind, their state of uh, mood, et cetera. And. Another one, um, our boys just don't get the same opportunities to receive help with their academic growth, 
Some of them haven't even been allowed to be kids at all. One of the concerns, you know, um, that uh, when we were measuring the different types of out-of-school time activities that the kids were doing after school, there was about uh, nearly a quarter of the kids in our survey sample who were responsible for taking care of their younger siblings, right, after school. So what does that necessarily mean where kids are exposed to or, or what I call being parentified, right, have to take on those because it's not just taking care of your sibling, but it's also being mindful of keeping them safe, making sure that they are fed, right? Um, I, have a, I have two kids, 11 and a 15-year-old, and my, you know, my 15-year-old, I swear, he thinks he's like 40, and it's his responsibility to constantly take care of his little sister, right? And I keep telling him, I said, no, I need you to just be a silly, non-productive um, teenager right now, right? Um, not too often, though. Uh, so paying attention to um, the types of things that, uh, that kids are needing, the, um, that, that these kids are not being allowed to do is, uh, is a vitally important that it became a vital important element of how they were developing their context. Um, and then lastly, so I think if we're going to help these boys, we've got to understand what they face. Uh, there was always an attention to contextualizing the realities that the kids were coming from and not something that they were sugarcoating, romanticizing and saying, you know, th making statements like, oh, well, you know, these kids are poor. So um, and they were it's like, the, you know, not only are they experiencing depths of poverty, but they could, you know, these adults could actually talk about the nature to which they were experiencing. So it's not just a, you know, a, um, a broad stroke of what is poverty, but rather what are the realities around poverty? They haven't had access to consistent health care. There isn't um, the types of food environments or there's a, a food desert, right? A food supermarket desert within their community. They were able to talk at that level in terms of their kids. So that was part of sort of the, the, the mission that was driving the schools. Their instructional model, which was high levels of remediation, high levels of remediation because they were getting these kids at middle school and high school so they had had they already had been exposed to a great deal of of, of uh, what my colleague Pedro Noguera calls um, uh, ABT they ain't been taught right so by the time they showed up you know there was a high level of remediation that the school sites had to do not only during school and that's where out of school time you know the struggle that I had with you know parts of their out of school time is that so much of it was remediation but I understood the reality that the kids were showing up with, right? That they were showing up two to three grade levels behind, and if they had those high missions for these kids um, as part of what they were trying to do, they had to make sure that they, sh not only did they have to remediate, you know, um, I kept pushing for them that you, you can't just do remediation. You gotta do remediation with acceleration because the rest of their peers who are not at those sites and are still growing, you know, their pace is still faster and remediation is not gonna be enough. You actually have to pay attention to acceleration, acceleration. There is also an attention to cultural relevance within the curriculum, and then finally relational work. So it wasn't just that you couldn't, we weren't hiring, they weren't hiring just any old body, anybody you know who they put a mirror under their, their nose to make sure they were breathing, right? But there has, the, the population of adults who had to be there recognized that they were existing within a context where they needed to put in 10 to 12 hour days, on site and off, right? So that was part of the, the recognition of of, of being that. Uh, so, you know, as an example of sort of some of the cultural relevance, uh, uh, this teacher talks about, given the group that we're, we're teaching, we're working with African-American males, many of whom have been turned off to school, so just even doing things like readings must include their culture, right? So the absence of recognition that you actually have a social identity in, in school is a detrimental, is, is creating um, that protective environment to be a very low protective environment because there's an absence of recognizing the social identities that, that is natural to who they are, right? And, uh, and to not acknowledge it becomes, you know, it's not, uh, it's not allowing them to actually have full levels of development. Um, their school climate model paid attention to, uh, the strategies that they paid attention to always had to do around believing education, using out of school time, promoting caring relationships, um, and uh, developing positive social identities. And I'm not gonna spend too much time in many of these. I have a set of slides around it because I wanna get to sort of what I call the drum roll. But I wanna highlight a couple of things is that there is um, the, the develop, particular development of positive social identities. Um, uh, the schools had to pay, had to recognize 
that these boys were showing up hurt, right? Hurt not just in terms of their academic progress or absence of, but also hurt in terms of the type of self-esteem of how they recognize themselves, right? There was one particular, I remember one school where I had the opportunity to sit in, in one of their class classes that was, um, uh, that I can't remember the topic of the class, uh, the, the content, but I remember one of the ac uh, character activities that they were doing is that they had all the boys sit with mirrors, and they were sitting in a circle, and the boys had to sit there and hold the mirror in front of them and describe themselves, right? Some of the language that the boys were using to describe themselves, and these were, um, these were adolescents, right? I'm ugly. I'm too dark. My lips are too big, right? All of these, all of these sort of characteristics of how they were describing themselves, which we knew, under we understood as ways in which they also perceived the rest of the world was seeing them, right? Was so um, it was it hurt me to just sit there and listen to that and recognize that that's part of the, the self-concept that they had about themselves. So in some of these sites, what they had to work on is we have got to change the direction in which they are seeing their own social identity. And so, uh, you know, and as much as, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm harking this back to the other, you know, to the uh, when the administrator raised a question, well, how long do we have to do this in terms of this type of mentoring program? Forever, right? Because the scars, the emotional scars of being viewing yourself from the perspective of how the rest of the world sees you takes a long time to just heal. And I'm not even talking about, I'm not even thinking about it as getting over because you don't get over it. You heal from it and you move on. So I think, so positive social identity work which we actually ex ended up spending a great uh, a whole entire chapter really paying attention to was a vital it was an important element that we did not anticipate spending a great deal of time in understanding but we realized we had to and it was an element of their context that they had to really work on a great deal so i'm not going to go through sort of the some of this data around uh, you know the belief you know we used uh, a variety of scales to really sort of test the different levels of uh, some of the things that they were working on. So we used the uh, Academic Educational Belief Scale from Rosalind Mickelson. Um, Rosalind Mickelson, if you don't know, wanted to challenge the idea that is pervasive, which is that, that um, low-income African-American and Latino populations of kids don't care about education, right? That's why they're not engaged in school. And so it early in the early 90, 1990s, she actually, her research focused on the idea that there's actually two forms of beliefs, educational beliefs. There's abstract and concrete beliefs of education. Abstract beliefs of education is what we all believe in. Education is going to help us be socially mobile. And what she found is that low-income, African-American kids, Latino kids, they all believe in abstract notions of educational beliefs. But what they didn't buy was the concrete notions of educational beliefs, which is what we sell in the context of school. So they believed in the idea of education. They just weren't buying how we were packaging it, right? So we wanted to make sure that we, you know, we test drove that idea that the kids and actually in these settings were wholeheartedly embracing abstract notions of educational beliefs. And over time, they were absorbing, they were holding more, on, they were uh, grasping more of the concrete notions of educational beliefs. Um, the same thing we could say around, we had our scale around caring relationships and the degree to which there it, it was pervasive throughout, throughout our context. Um, and for the most part, the kids over time continuously felt that the adults were there for them. And in particular, that's the case because um, in many of the settings, the staff were required to constantly keep themselves available for kids, right? Two of the sites, the staff had cell phones that they were, they were given by the administrator to keep on at all times. And the kids had their cell phone number so that they could call that teacher or whomever that may be, that adult, on to uh, regardless of what it may be, right? So that nature to which caring had to, it wasn't just the, um, the adults, you know, saying, you know, it, it, um, sort of not only sort of using certain language to kids, but they constantly had to make sure that they had a presence with their kids, right? Um, it, it, for me, it hearkened to, um, I've seen different models of how this type of mentorship happens. And one that comes to mind, I know, is the, 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 the Children's Aid Society's uh, African American Male Initiative where they have the, the life coaches, right? So the idea that there's a constant person who is there to be my advocate in whatever context I'm in. And then obviously the last uh, area that we wanted to pay attention to was stereotype threat, right? Stereotype threat, you know, basically situates that there's a constant threat that's living uh, for individuals who experience racial marginal racialized marginalization, right? Well, we actually found that, that in these contexts, 
stereotype threat actually dissipated over time. That the more time they spent, you know, in these types of schools. Now, you know, I've, I've been careful in terms of how I talk about this. So it's it's not about being in these black and Latino boys schools, but rather being in these contexts in when their social identity is not treated as a threat or as a problem. Right. I want to make sure I acknowledge that because stereotype threat can be dissipated in other types of spaces, right? Particularly uh, 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 mixed income and mixed racial environments, um, it can occur. But it's a matter of how do we treat the different types of social identities that are there. So, um, so you know, so I, I put in there obviously sort of the ways in which some of the boys described, you know, um, their, uh, their own identity work, right? So this one, this 10th grader talks about, I like the fact that I don't have to hide my personality, right? Um, the people have different views of us because they don't see us for what we see in ourselves. That identity work was vital for us to pay attention to that intersection between person, context, and beliefs. And then finally, the ways in which uh, uh, OSC program components existed, there was a component of it that was interest-based programming. There was a lot of enrichment activities, and I will say that some of the school sites had to change their interests because initially some of their interest stuff was based on the adults' presumptions of what boys do, right? They were like, oh, we got to put football in. They weren't getting enough boys to put together a team because it wasn't that interest, right? One of the sites, one of the interests that developed over time, and, and this is during sort of one of the, the, the book crazes of uh, Harry Potter. So they created a Harry Potter um, book club, and, you know, there were more boys showing up there than were showing up for, um, like, the, the, the football team practice, right? And that was instructive for them to understand as adults. They had to step out of their own notions of what they perceived as boy interests and actually ask the boys who are there what are the interests that they actually have. Um, also, part of their programming is making sure that it's uh, a good deal of the staff that worked at the school during the school day also worked in after school, but they also were mindful of needing to bring in other sets of adults, particularly around their mentoring components. So bringing in community members who had different types of presence, right, in the larger context. And then finally, obviously in terms of remediation, you know, I can't, uh, you know, and I, as much as I say, I'm like, I, I struggle with the fact that we have to do so much of that in out of school time. Right? That why do we have to take the responsibility of what six and a half hours during the school day you can't do? Right? Uh, but I also recognize, you know, we can get into that, that um, philosophical struggle, right? But not at the expense of the kids, because the kids at the end of the day needed to, to experience remediation. But there had to be an attention to remediation with acceleration. So, so how did all of this interaction play out, right? In terms of, you know, so qualitatively we were learning all this stuff. And we had to, we knew with our funder, we had to be able to prove statistically, so how does this play out? So how did, did, the, did the development of this type of context actually have an impact on our kids? I remember the impact that I had to pay attention to was academic performance. So, um, so I'm not going to go through the different scales that we had in our, um, uh, in our study, and it, but you can obviously raise that as a question during our Q&A. Um, as you can see, we had a lot of stuff. So drum roll, right? So our drum roll, what we learned, uh, actually I, I should say we learned a great deal up to this point. Before we started statistically sort of playing out this model, we had learned a great deal in terms of what does it mean for a context to actually think about the population that they're serving and actually continuously adjust themselves to serve. Um, so what we learned was that uh, grade po uh, academic performance, which we, what we used was uh, grade point average, right? Uh, why we use grade point average is because we were looking at seven different schools in four different states, right? So we're there we're, we couldn't use state standardized exams because they had different scalings, right? Um, so grade point average became our, our, our constant that existed across all of our sites. So what did we learn? Is that uh, one of the, so what we learned is that the four areas that actually said so the three um, sets of variables that were most instructive in terms of influencing grade point average. Um, and I'm only talking about three of them versus the fourth one. The fourth one is other control variables. So, we'll, so within statistical modeling, you have to control for certain variables to make sure that, you know, and the controls that we were working on is making sure, irregardless of school, irregardless of grade level, these three other variables were the ones that were most powerful. So as you can see here, what, what was most powerful? Academic engagement. Right. So given much of what we laid, what I laid out before in terms of the context, what the types of things that they were doing, you know, 
for us, we were like, wow. So academic engagement, which is relational engagement, behavioral engagement, and cognitive engagement, right? So the degree to which kids feel supported, they're interested in what's happening, and they actually know how to do what they're supposed to do, um, was playing out most powerfully and contributing the greatest to their academic performance. And instructional challenge, which is what many of these school settings were being you know, pressed on, and many of our schools now are being pressed on, and I'm, I'm also, he also understanding that out-of-school times are also being pressed uh, out of school time programs are also being pressed on, you know, how are you gonna, how are you infusing common core in your, you know, programming is that it, for these kids in this types of context, it didn't really matter the degree of rigor and instructional challenge that was actually existing. It was actually the other types, uh, the other sets of uh, resilient skills and attitudes that the school was actually working on developing. Um, and the other piece was the nature of school climate. So, so let me start first by saying, in terms of academic engagement, so what specifically within academic engagement played out the most? Um, so what was very powerful was behavioral engagement, which is the ways in which kids figure out how to do school, right? How do they be successful within the context of school? What was most powerful for helping kids be successful was relational and cognitive engagement working together, which means the degree to which I actually have somebody I feel supported by and I'm interested to what's happening in school helps me know how to do school. Makes sense, right? I'm not, you know, you're not going to learn from somebody you don't like, correct? Unless, um, unless you're a very unique individual, right? That you can actually learn from somebody you don't like. Mo for adolescents, they're not going to learn from somebody they don't like and that they don't feel supported around, right? And also, they, you know, kids are always talking about it has got to be interesting. Right now, their interests don't always marry with our interests, right? So that's why we always have to be cognizant of what is the way in which they cognitively engage to what's happening. And the other element that also fed was school climate. Now, school climate, what we were measuring was um, there was four components: fairness, the degree to which kids actually felt that the environment was fair for them, and the way we were measuring fairness, we were actually paying attention to the degree to which they actually felt as if felt as if their identities were not going to be used in a way that they felt was going to treat them unfairly. The other measure of climate was cultural cohesion. So the degree to which the actual environment where they actually, again, felt as if their social identity was being praised and uh, applauded, right? A sense of belonging. When we're talking about adolescence, right? You, you know, that age 12, to 19, so much of it is about trying to fit in, trying to figure out who you are, and having peer networks that actually you connect with become very important. So having a sense of belonging and having a place where you actually feel a sense of belonging, that's one of the things that I enjoy about Boys and Girls Club, that they always talk about finding your place, right? Having that sense of belonging within there. So it's vitally important. So that was um, one of the other elements of our school climate measure. And the, um, uh, and so yeah, so those are the elements, right? So that also contributed to the way in which kids were figuring out uh, how to be successful in the context of these schools. Cognitive engagement, because part of it, you know, in the, the beauty of doing statistical work is that we're able to kind of get as, as, uh, as, as micro as we can and then having qualitative data to actually help us amplify the degree to which these actually played out. So we were, we were understanding that, you know, that cognitive engagement obviously was something that mattered a great deal to kids. So well, what was feeding it? And as you can see here, what was feeding the degree to which kids actually were interested in school was relational engagement. Again, so the degree to which I actually have somebody who supports me is feeding the degree to which I actually am interested in what's happening, right? How often do we actually have to think very critically around the type of programming that we do in out-of-school time, also in relation to who is going to be doing that type of programming, right? Because what we don't want is we don't want a, a dud doing a program that we know kids are going to find vitally interesting, right? I remember one of the, um, uh, when I would uh, run after school programs, um, uh, one, of the one, and one of the things I did every fall was that the teachers who wanted to work in the after school program, they had to put, I put, on to put together a fair, an out of school time fair. So you had to display what you were going to do with the kids for your eight, six to eight week time frame, and, and you had to be engaging. And if the kids didn't sign up, you wasn't working in after school, right? 
because I recognized that it had to actually be something that was interesting to kids, but they also had to know that the adult that they were going to be working with, they had, s- had to have some sense in which that adult was going to be somebody that was going to be supportive for them and actually find them valuable in the context in their programming. And then obviously the cli- school climate piece, right, mattered a great deal to, to the degree to which kids were feeling cognitively engaged. Right, so if I don't feel that there's a sense of fairness in my environment, if I don't feel a sense of cultural cohesion and a sense of belonging, why exactly would I be interested in what's actually happening here? And then, lastly, relational engagement, right? Um, which I, th- you know, I left for last because for me, I think that's the one area that we don't do enough work around in really trying to. And I hate to use this language, but I, I, I'm, I can't find any other way. But we have to figure out how we do programming around relational work. We can't rely on just saying, you know, that somebody told you that I want to work in after school because I like kids, right? We actually have to make sure that we are programming the way in which we develop staff so that they know how to practice relational work, right? And that relational work, particularly when we think about it as in the simple ways of the type of language that are that adults use with kids, right? Um, and I know it's not hard, right? Uh, I was th- I'm thinking I'm always test driving you know, language with my own kids because I'm trying to figure out, you know, particularly my 15-year-old who just loves to wait till the last minute to study for an exam. And I, I want to use supportive and affirmative language. But what, on, what comes to mind is not the best language, <laughs> right? So I understand that it's hard, but, um, but when we're talking about populations who are experiencing high-risk and low-protective environments, it is vitally important that we are attentive to the way in which our relational work, in particular language that we're using in developing that relationship, is affirmative and uh, supportive for the population that we're working with here. So, so relational engagement, um, what was obviously what was uh, vital to sort of supporting that was the ways in which cognitive engagement was happening. So there's something about the intersection between having adults that support you and being interested kept playing out for these kids, right? Um, and, and that became extremely instructive for us in understanding how you develop a context like this. So. Lastly, and this is my concluding thought, that um, in these environments, and I, you know, uh, is that we have to, um, uh, the ways in which these settings were creating um, the interaction of social and academic supports, you know, that being the crux of the type of context that they're doing for their kids, um, uh, held at the center of who the person was, right, who these kids were. They did not take for granted that they had black and Latino boys who had prior school experiences, who were coming from environments that had um, high risk factors and been exposed to a great deal of low protective environments, that now they were coming into a space where they had to figure out how to mitigate all that. Uh, And so so understanding that interaction between person and context is what's, uh, what I, what is uh, one of the most instructive piece that comes out of this, this set of research. And in particular for me, you know, this is my own little, sh- you know, shtick is the relational piece, right? Um, because all the other stuff we have, you know, particularly in out-of-school time, we've done a pretty good job in making sure on the cognitive engagement stuff, we've gotten pretty good over the last 20 years around building good curriculum so that kids are interested in what's happening. Um, but how do we pay attention to that relational stuff so it is not by accident, but is uber intentional in every element of what we do. And with that, I will pause.